So tonight we're going to talk about the GI assessment and maybe some important terminology that you might want to know as well. And when we assess the GI system, we also have to consider um, the other aspects of um, the GI system, which is you know, your general nutritional status as well. So there's many powerhouses of your digestive system. It's a lot of tubes um, to get to different places, but um, you know, effectively it all starts with your mouth or your oral cavity. There's the long tube that goes to your stomach, also known as your esophagus esophagus, your stomach, then you have small intestines, which help to digest large intestines, which help with that digestion and really moving things along. And then you have your rectum and anus, which help to, um, you know, get the stuff that you're done digesting and processing out um, into a landfill near you. So there's also some honorable mentions for the GI system. There's the liver, which is really important because that helps to process your nutrients and your vitamins. And then there's your gallbladder, which helps to absorb and digest your fats. Um, and then additionally, your pancreas helps to secrete enzymes, which help with digestion. So what kind of questions do I need to ask um, a patient that might have a gastrointestinal or abdominal problem? We wanna ask them about their appetite. What have they been eating? Have they been eating um, normally or has anything changed there? Have they had any weight loss or weight gain? When was their last meal? Um, have they had any dysphagia, maybe difficulty swallowing, nausea, vomiting, or indigestion? Um, what about their last bowel movement? What was the color or the consistency or how much was it? Um, are they having any pain in their abdomen? Uh, we also want to ask them, are they have any, uh, or so are they taking any medications that might irritate their ab uh, abdominal system? So aspirin, NSAIDs, steroids, blood thinners, all of these medications can be really hard on the stomach. Um, and a lot of medications can, by the way. Um, so we always want to ask them about what medications they're taking too, because a lot of times medications can be the culprit. So we always start with inspection. So when we inspect the abdomen, we want to start by just looking at it, uh, which means we actually have to pull the gown up. We can't just look um, based on what we see uh, from, you know, uh, over top the gown. We want to look underneath. Is there any abnormalities? Um, you know, what would we say about this abdomen? There's kind of this abnormal protrusion going on in this abdomen. So we're looking for, you know, any sort of, you know, abnormal prominences, any sort of, um, you know, uh, masses, uh, lesions. Um, we're looking for maybe previous surgeries, like if they have any drains or tubes, um, incisions, things like that as well. Um, abnormal contour, we're looking, you know, of course, at color and other things as well. So let's go kind of deeper into some of this inspection. So we're going to start with color. Pale or blue could be normal for the patient, depending on what their uh, normal color is, but it also could indicate that they're not getting good perfusion to that area. Um, yellow is common in uh, patients with liver problems. It's a sign of jaundice. We also want to um, note maybe any discoloration about the belly button or flank area. When we talk about pancreatitis, we talk about the um, Cullen sign or the Gray Turner sign. And um, these are discolorations or bruisings around the belly button or flank area. So these can be a sign that there's bleeding inside or a pancreas problem. Again, we want to look at contour. Is it symmetrical? Is it equal on both sides? Is there any lumps or masses? It could be a sign of a hernia, an obstruction, or some sort of organ that's not functioning the way that it's supposed to. Any pulsation, it could be a sign that there's an aorta problem, which is that big blood vessel that's in your abdomen. Um, and then, you know, words to describe contour, we can use flat, rounded, obese, um, what do you call it, um, irregular or um, asymmetrical. Um, you know, there's a lot of different words that we can use. So um, we're really just trying to describe what the general shape is because um, a lot of times shape can tell us a lot about what's going on. And the person at the top is not pregnant. That's what ascites is. And that can be pretty intense stuff that happens with uh, patients with liver disorders. Um, so what else is present? Again, we want to look for scars or bruising. If they've had previous, previous surgeries or traumas, we need to know about them because that's going to help us to better take care of them. We also want to look for any lesions, rashes, um, or uh, what do you call it, the like stretch marks, um, which are sometimes normal like in pregnancy, but sometimes can be a sign of an abnormality too. Uh, we want to also look for lines, tubes, and drains, feeding tubes, um, you know, tubes from the bowel or the bladder, surgical drains. All of these things are really important to look at. So here's some pictures of them. We want to look for any tubes coming out of the nose, like a nasogastric tube. Um, these drains, they're called Jackson Pratt drains or JP drains. They're common. They come out of, um, for abdominal surgeries, they help to drain fluid that might still be coming out. We're going to look for any sort of ostomy, whether it's a ostomy in the uh, abdomen, like an ileostomy or a colostomy, or 
or down here, like this is a urostomy, which is where um, the bladder is draining fluid. We also might do what's called a hemovac, and a hemovac is effectively um, similar to a JP drain where it's draining blood from an incision. And then if there's any feeding tubes on the abdomen as well, we want to look for those. So after we inspect, because we always want to inspect first, we're going to auscultate. And this is a little different because, you know, normally uh, we caught, um, we may palpate first, but um, for the abdomen, we always want to auscultate first because you have to listen before you palpate. Because if you don't listen first, you can end up um, actually stimulating, um, you know, abdominal muscle contractions or causing peristalsis, which can lead to increased bowel sounds, which would be abnormal, um, you know, or like make you think that there's bowel sounds when there's not. It's just because you pressed on them. And you're going to listen in all four quadrants. You're going to listen, um, you know, usually I start in the right lower quadrant and make my way around clockwise. Um, but pretty much you're listening. Is, the, is there uh, normal sounds like, you know, which normally you just hear kind of, uh, you know, uh, normal sounds. It can sound kind of like tinkling or um, water can move around. It can kind of sound like, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, it's kind of, it sounds sometimes like uh, water rushing through and things like that. Everyone sounds a little bit different, um, but if you can hear them pretty normally, like you put your stethoscope down and pretty regularly they're happening, um, that's normoactive. If they're really soft or not happening very often, that's what we call hypoactive. And then if they're happening, like you're barely having to um, put your stethoscope down or when you put your stethoscope down, they're continuous, that's hyperactive. Um, and I'm not going to try to pronounce this too well, but um, uh, baborgisms, I believe it's called. It's like, that's where like I can hear someone's hungry and I'm not even putting my stethoscope on them. Um, and then absent, um, you know, means like you put your stethoscope on, you listen for five minutes and you don't hear anything. Um, and that's very abnormal. And that's actually a very bad sign unless they just had surgery or something like that. There's a few times where it's okay, but usually absent bowel sounds, that's usually a big warning sign. So after we listen, then we can palpate. Um, and we always do light palpation. I know sometimes you might learn something differently. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but effectively light palpation is I'm just feeling to see, do they have tenderness? I wanna, as I'm pressing, before I press, I'm gonna make sure they're not already having any tenderness. And if they are, you know, um, as I'm doing, as I'm pressing, I want to be asking like, where does it hurt more? Cause that's going to help me as a whole to kind of figure out what the um, is going on with the patient or where their problem is. Um, and so I'm feeling effectively to see if they have pain or discomfort. And of course, then if I, if there's any really noticeable mass or lump or, um, you know, think anything like that, um, like that might be like a hernia or something going on inside their intestines, et cetera, <clears throat> or an enlarged organ, then I definitely want to um, check for that. We also need to do an anal assessment. We wanna look for hemorrhoids, which can be present. Um, we also wanna look for any rashes, irritation or inflammation like skin breakdown. Um, and then any, uh, we wanna to ask too, cause a lot of times anal problems can uh, manifest as burning or itching in that area. So we wanna do a really thorough inspection and then also ask them about some of the symptoms they may be experiencing. Don't forget the mouth. Most people don't really think about the mouth when they think of the GI system, um, but the mouth is a very important part. Um, we wanna look to see signs of hydration. Are the lips dry or pale? Um, do they have teeth present? Are they able to chew? Cause that's gonna affect their nutrition. If they don't have teeth or um, they don't have um, good uh, you know, dentures or things like that, or they're not able to chew or swallow, that's gonna severely affect their ability to get nutrition. We also wanna look at other things. Like if they have lesions or sores in their mouth, that's gonna make it very difficult for them to to uh, you know, swallow and get food in their mouth because it may be too painful to eat. And we wanna assess their ability to swallow. And we're looking for those signs, again, kind of bringing you back to um, neurological assessment. We wanna look for signs that they're having any difficulty swallowing, any coughing, um, you know, any sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, like their oxygen saturations go down or they're really struggling um, when we're, uh, after we're testing their ability to swallow or after they swallow something, like they're definitely not handling it well. We're also listening to their lung sounds and seeing if they swallow well, are they aspirating, things like that as well. Is the food going where it's supposed to? So we wanna do a good nutrition assessment as well and see, is our patient eating? Is their diet appropriate? Not only just can they chew it, cause you know, sometimes patients don't have teeth and then you, know, you look on their tray and they have a hamburger and it's like, well, how are they supposed to eat that? Um, and then even if it is appropriate for what their physical capabilities are, are they tolerating it? Or is it too much for them? Or is it missing an ingredient or has too much of an ingredient and that's hurting them? We always wanna um, have them on a diet that's specific to their diagnosis and their abilities.
Um, and we'll talk more in class about diagnoses that have special diets because most of them do. And I know you guys love memorizing and learning about foods and different diets. So you'll have fun doing that for your GI section. Um, we also want to look for signs of inadequate nutrition. So labs like the prealbumin, we can also look at uh, vitamin and mineral levels and electrolyte levels. <coughs> Excuse me on this. Additionally, um, to the prealbumin, we also get the albumin. And the real difference there is, is that the prealbumin is kind of like the baby albumin. It tells us how much um, of that protein are we making. And if we're not making a lot of that protein, it's usually a sign of malnutrition. Whereas that albumin, it's in the body, it's hanging around for a while, kind of like red blood cells. So you can have a good amount of albumin, but still not be making enough new albumin. And that's really the problem we look at. So um, both of those are helpful though. So we check the prealbumin, we check the albumin. Um, we check their vitamins and minerals, and again, their electrolytes, because all of those are related together. <clears throat> so there's multiple labs that we can check for patients that have like pancreas or gallbladder issues. Um, you know, we're going to be checking the amylase lipase. We may be checking some bilirubin levels and things like that as well. Um, we also want to worry about bleeding in the gastrointestinal system. So we're going to look for, um, we're going to maybe check an occult stool, and occult means hidden. So we look for blood that might be in the stool that we just can't see. We may also get a stool culture to see if there's bacteria growing. And then, um, you know, a lot of GI problems can manifest with fluid and electrolyte imbalances or infection. So we're going to get a CBC and a chemistry. Uh, additionally, um, we may get some diagnostic tests and that can be like a barium swallow. And this can help us because as much as we can assess a patient, sometimes we don't know if someone's silently aspirating. So a barium swallow actually gets us to, allows us to watch to see if stuff's going where it's supposed to. Like right now with me, stuff's not going down <laughs> the right place that it's supposed to. So uh, we also can get a CT or MRI of their abdomen, which might be helpful to diagnose specific organ disease. Um, for gallbladder problems, we can get what's called a HIDA scan, um, and that's going to let us look more in depth at the gallbladder. Uh, and then we may do an endoscopy, um, you know, where we're looking, it's what's called an EGD. It's a very, very long word that I'm not going to um, uh, embarrass myself and pronounce, but effectively it's like an upper um, GI scope where I'm going down and looking, seeing if maybe there's, um, you know, extra acid or infection, or if I need to get a biopsy in the um, stomach or see what's going on in the stomach or in the esophagus. Um, they also have colonoscopies where we can go up from the anus and explore the, uh, you know, the colon and the uh, large intestines. And then um, there's what's called an ERCP, and that's where we go in um, and look at the um, uh, gallbladder and can kind of see if there's stuff going on with that. And there's also a cool endoscopy called a capsule endoscopy, which is where they, you actually swallow this capsule that's a camera. And that way we can actually look in your small intestines because... <clears throat> because of the way that um, scopes work, you know, like an upper endoscopy, I can't see past a certain area, like, you know, um, for the upper. And if I go up through the lower, I can only go so far. So there's some areas of the intestines that I can't see with the scopes. So this capsule endoscopy allows me to get pictures inside without having to be invasive. Um, and then you just poop it out. Um, and then there's also ultrasound to look more firmly at organs, maybe what's going on with them. So obviously there's a lot of GI disorders and, um, you know, the assessment's going to be tailored to each of these. A lot of it's looking for what symptoms they're having, <clears throat> what part of their abdomen. So it's really helpful to kind of know, like, based on where their pain is, what organs are in each of those places. So as you get to uh, better at these assessments, you'll start to kind of learn, you know, um, which pain is associated with which area. Um, and then also those more specific questions to ask for those uh, different, you know, uh, gastrointestinal disorders. Uh, and uh, nutrition is a big uh, problem in, uh, here in America. And so definitely as you start to um, do this more, you'll start to kind of see those signs that a patient, you know, regardless of what their weight is, um, weight is not a sign of whether someone's nourished or not. So it's always good to kind of know what are those signs of malnourishment. So we'll get into this a little bit deeper in class, but hope this was a helpful start. See you next time.